How's it going guys? Today we're going to look at how to arrange your C++ projects. This is all about folder structure, include source, resources, all that. So full disclosure and as not to hide anything, this here is the plan right there. So we're going to talk about how to organize your project. This might be a series. I'm going to try to cover it all in just one video here and we'll see how that goes. So C++ arrangement methods. So let's start with making libraries. Okay, so I have written here the standard is public headers go in include, project name, everything else goes in source. So let me show you an example. So we head right on over to GitHub here and we're just gonna look at a few different ones. Let's check out Asimp, which is an open asset importer library repository. That's kind of hard to say. So this is a very, uh, very public library that's used very frequently for loading 3D models in your, your code. It pulls in all the whatever, you know. So let's take a look at how it's arranged. So it's got this big, this is uh, the structure of it, but what we're interested in is the code section because it's got a lot of additional stuff. Uh, I guess actually they include. So this is the public part. If you're including and linking this libraries, which is another topic, uh, this is what you need. You need all these headers to include in your project. So you, and the reason it's in this subfolder of the project name is so you have clarity of what exactly is being included. Because if you're just in, including bitmap, bitmap from what? But now if it's asimp slash bitmap, you know it's from asimp. So that is the point of having the project name. And same with all this other stuff. You can find lots of examples online of how to use this library. It's not really what this is about. I'll do some more tutorials on how to use libraries later. I just want to talk about structuring projects. So if you're building your own, this is how you want to do it. Okay, so just launching my uh, little game engine here thing that I've been working on real quick. And I just want to show you how it's all included in my project. And just an example of asset being used. What is with this? This is not the last theme I chose. I don't know why it looks like this. Let's go to dark. Okay, so... Um, well, I guess here's another example. So my library here... This AA engine is a library. It's like a game engine helper library, basically. And I also do the same thing, following the standard for this library. Include Ancient Archer, and there is the main header. The one and only is a utility, which you don't need to use. But as a someone who's using this library, you just want to include that. And I'm also using Asimp in here in some places. Now, this is still being worked out. This isn't like necessarily the best example in the world. But let's just take a look. If uh, If I go to like my model loader here which is in my render i think model loader you can see when i include asim of course i gotta include that because otherwise it would just be importer and who knows what that is right so that's why you put it in the include and then the project name again just so it's clear where it's coming from so and what do you do with your source well you, most people just put it in the source and then you structure your other files. These are all private. All your public headers should be here. Everything else, private headers, etc., go in there. So let me just see how they're doing it here on Asim. If we back up a few, it looks like rather than source, they're calling it code. So this code is all the private code. And uh, yeah, everything else is just extra stuff, stuff, sample scripts, whatever, their build stuff, all that. But we're only talking about the code here in this video. Maybe we want to look at another example. Let's look at GLM, which is a header only library. GLM, oh, we're uh, in all of GitHub here. Uh, let me find the right one. Is this it? Gro I don't think this is it. I don't know, this might be. Uh, this is probably an old version of it, but we'll see a similar thing here. We'll see um well this is a little different because this is a header only library so you just include this base thing and then when you want to actually use something it's still you still access it through glm slash whatever but since this is header only they don't have the include folder so take note of that if it's header only library you're not necessarily going to have the include folder because the whole thing is the include folder basically um i guess in this case that's a little bit of a different case here Okay, let's look at another one. Let's look at, look at the POCO library, which is uh, C++ libraries for building network stuff. And we'll see a very similar thing here. So they have a ton of stuff in here. 
and let's just see what we can find. Do they have an include folder? Include? No. So they're doing something a little differently here. Let's just click around. It looks like they have different sections here. What do they got? Source. That's all CPP. So some of these are going to be a little bit different, I guess. Uh, let's, let's find it. It's got to be in here somewhere. Okay, so if I go back to my project and I just give it a quick test by going, okay, so if I go to include and let the IntelliSense kick in and I see POCO, there it is. So, and then what? And then you go to whatever it is. So it looks like it might be the case here that they aren't necessarily doing it the standard way on this particular library. So your results may vary a little bit. And uh, we're going to talk more about libraries here in a second. No, I'm, I'm a little curious how they have this. So it might be in the build. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing here. I honestly don't understand this uh, library right off. So usually they should have an include folder of all their public stuff. It appears they're doing it a little differently here, but it looks like it's sorted out. And uh, so you're just going to have to analyze case by case. But in general, include project name, go from there and everything else goes in your source or code folder. Now, so that's for making libraries. You want to do that. That's People are always going to know this in general, C++ programmers. If you're doing something different, if you're going against the grain, that might be fine. Maybe you found a better way, but this tends to be pretty clear. Uh, it looks like Poco found a different way. So just digging into this Poco a little bit. Now, I must admit that I haven't really used Poco a lot, so I'm not super familiar with it. Maybe it wasn't the best one for me to pick because of that. But I just went into this folder called Redis, which is probably redistribution, and they do have an include in here. So it might be the case that they have uh, POCO somewhere here or NET and then include. Yeah, here it is. So I guess it depends what section of it. It looks like there's a bunch of sub libraries within POCO. So you'll see that too. So it looks like if you want to use the NET stuff, you got to include uh, this folder here, this include, and then you'll be including POCO slash NET slash whatever H. And you'll see these are all H files or no CPP files because these are all public headers. So it takes a little analysis to figure it out if it's a bigger library with a bunch of different sections, but it looks like that's the case in all of them. You just go into one of the different sections and you can see that they have that include and then the project name again. All right, well, let's move on to the next thing. And that's about applications. How do you section, how do you make your application? So we're kind of ignoring libraries for a second. We will come back to including libraries. Don't worry. So I'll talk more about that. So stay tuned. Okay, applications. So your different options here, you can do folders per class or folders per section, pure flat or headers for everything with one main file that all the headers build into. And we'll, we'll talk about these a little bit. Let's kind of go in order here. I'm going to actually just close this. We're going to open a terminal, I guess. Yeah, we're going to open a terminal. And I'm just going to make a directory called demo project, cd demo project. Now, uh, keep in mind that I'm using the Windows special terminal here. Maker only exists because I have installed WSL. Uh, just FYI. All right, so let's talk about this folders per class. So in this case, if you're making an application, not a library, this is like, you know, a standalone application that runs, not for other people to include. Uh, it's just uh, to do your main thing. Uh, you, you'll, you'll do something like this. Now, you can keep it, you can keep all your code on the root level. That's somewhat fine. That would be some more along the lines of pure flat. But what you, most people usually do is they make a directory called code, or they make a directory called source, or they make a directory called source spelled out. It doesn't matter. I prefer SRC personally. That's what I like to do these days, but that changes. So I'm going to go into that directory. Uh, we're going to do a clear. Uh, and there's nothing in it. We're just, we're just in this path. All right. So next, what we want to do here is, uh, so let's do the example of folders per class. Let's say we have our main data class. So we'll just make another directory within here called, uh, we'll just call it data. I know it's really generic. It should have a better name, uh, but I'm just, I'm just going to use data. What doesn't it like about this? Oh, I spelled it wrong. Make dir data it helps to spell your commands wrong. So these are kind of Linux commands for, um, for windows with PowerShell. Well, you're probably just going to create folders with whatever IE you're using, or you can right click and create a new folder. 
uh, with new folder, or you can do this make dir thing if you have WSL and you're using the window, new Windows terminal, or there's so many ways you can do like, there's like a new item, I forget what it is. You can look up just Google PowerShell create folder command and you'll find it. And you can find that command for any of these if you're not sure and you wanna get good at it, it just takes practice. Um, all right, but we're gonna stick with the Linux commands because those are the ones I'm most used to and they're working. So let's talk about folders per class again. We made the directory data. If we do a list, we see it. So we're gonna go into data and then we'll we'll just make some files. Now I'm gonna use, I think it's, let's see if touch works, data.cpp and data.h. Doesn't like that. Hold on, let me look this up. Okay, so also you can also just make these by right clicking and do new file, but it likes to make them as like text files or something predetermined, or you might have an IDE that's just, you might have like a create class button within your IDE that's fine but if you want to do it all in the command line i guess you got to do this new dash item and then you do a path item value so we're just going to do data dot h and there it makes it new dash item data dot cpp and then when we edit these i'm going to use visual to not visuals yeah visual studio code um data dot h data dot cpp and that should launch them within visual studio code here it's probably going to yell at me for updates and install stuff whatever we're not going to do that so then you would start designing up your classes and just real quick i'll do a i'll do a quick example here so all right so public we have a constructor a destructor a set the data with and we're just using integer for the data and uh we're using a get data now notice uh this i could you know we could have a, a, a get data that's something more like um returns the integer and doesn't take anything here so that's just something that a lot of people like to do they like to say you pass a reference to what you want to fill uh, that way you don't have to return anything so that's what this get data is and this one would actually return it and now notice we don't have the definitions here we would do, do them in the associated cpp so we have this data.h prag once at the top very nice and we go over here and we would do include and then data.h and this is where we would do all our definitions uh, so just work those up real quick i'll just fill them out fast enough so that it would actually compile like this would actually compile but we want to do something like this one would be data equals the data the data and because it's just uh you know you, it's a reference to this piece so that it would just fill it out with whatever it is. That's one way of returning. We could also do return the data on um, this one where it returns an integer and it's just that. These getters and setters are totally optional. Some people don't like to use them at all and they just like to leave everything public. That's totally up to you and your project and how you're doing it. So empty constructor, empty destructor, or you know, you can do whatever you need to do there. Uh, of course, this one here would just be something like the data equals data. So that's like a quick way you have your whole class in a subfolder. So now if we look at this, see we got the, the our data and of course this would be something else. We go back a directory. We now have that data folder and nothing else, but we still need to like compile it into a main because every project needs a main. So where do you put your main? Usually when you do it this way, you just put it right on the, the root of source. So I'm gonna go new item main.cpp. Also, this doesn't need to be called main.cpp. It's just kind of the standard to call it that. So another FYI, there's a lot of this stuff that is like just standard, but now if we want to include it, we got to go into that data folder and then data again, which might be a little weird. So I don't prefer to do it this way, honestly, because just like saying the same thing twice seemed weird to me. I'd rather do a flat structure, but just you can do it. So now we can instantiate data. Okay, so now that we've got it filled out and we should be able to get an answer here, you know, there's other ways of filling out this what is. We could go what is equals data dot get data, you know, stuff like that. So a lot of options here to fill that out, but uh, so you would just fill it out. You would keep making more of these folders per class. And then the, a, a reason people like to do this sometimes is because in this data class, or yeah, within this data class, maybe you eventually have some helpers that go along with it or some sub structs that it needs or something like that. So you could include them in this folder as well and kind of start sectioning it off, which brings me to the next section. Um, 
folders per section. So the folders per class often told turns into folders per section. And then it starts to make a little more sense why you would do this. Uh, and then there's pure flat. So let's talk about pure flat real quick. Pure flat's pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm going to close all of these for a second. And we're going to just look at this. And we're going to go, actually, we're just going to go move data dot star back a directory. Now when we look in here, it's it's empty. So let's go back a directory and we'll see that everything's now flat. And we could go, I think it's delete the data folder. Yeah, it's gone. So now everything's in a flat structure. We could, uh, we could just open this whole folder like so. And of course, now we can just get rid of this. So what happens with a flat structure is you end up with a giant list of files all in one folder. And most people actually prefer that. It's a little easier. You just don't have to worry about pathing to your stuff all the time. But it's totally optional. Both are valid strats. And it just depends how you want to do it. So those are some of the different ways you can kind of organize your project per class per section. Now, of course, keep in mind when you're given your compiler commands, if you're not using some IDE for compiling, if you're using an IDE, it might be automatic, but if you're using a make file or creating your own uh, G++ build command, you've got to be sure to path to your stuff. So it'd be like main.cpp, data.cpp, and then you're out to be whatever. It's going to automatically do it. I don't think I have G. I don't have that installed. I might not have this installed or something, or I might have to launch um, one of my WSL Linux things to do that. But uh, so I'd have to, I'd have to build like MS build. I don't want to get into that too much. I can maybe do another video all about compiling. I think I have one actually, if you search my channel for C++ compilers, it should be the very first episode on my C++ series. So FYI, I go into a lot of that, but I don't want to do it here. We're just talking about structuring. So here's another way, the third way. Um, and just to go back to this, another benefit of doing this per, just section it off per class is each of these CPPs builds, builds their own object. So as things change within your project, it only rebuilds the objects that needs to rebuild, which can save you compile time. Because if you have say five different classes and you change one of them, it'll only rebuild that one class and then it will link everything together and make your executable. But this other way I'm about to talk about doing it is headers for everything. This is where you only have one CPP file, usually a main, and you build everything into one giant object. So it's kind of nice because, well, okay, I'll, tell, I'll show you why it's kind of nice. So if you look at this, you'll notice that we have, we're duplicating code here. Like we're putting set data here and we're saying set data again here. And we're just duplicating lots of text. And there are reasons for that, mainly because like the header only wants to know about the function, but it just needs to exist somewhere within your program, but for other stuff to call it, it just needs to know about it in this header type form. So that's just the way C++ is. But one thing you can do is you can take all these definitions and put them within your header, like so, and have no associated C++ file. And then when you go here into your main, as it includes it, it's going to build into this. So this will still work. But if you make another C++ file and also include data, you're going to get multiple or redefinition errors. So you got to watch out for that. You truly only need to have one. And there's another problem you can run into if you do this too, if you have a bunch of files. I guess I can, we can just hit this plus button to make new files. Let's say we have, uh, oh, we'll just call it other data.h. And we'll do a little pragma once here and we'll work up another class. I'll do it real quick. Okay. So I just made another class. It's essentially the same thing. It just named it other. But the point I want to make here is if these classes require each other, you can run into some tricky stuff uh, because the order of the include starts to matter. So if, for example, other data required data, and this is a really odd example, to be honest, because I'm just calling it data and other data, but it might be more like in a real example, if you have, say, uh, say you're structuring like uh, um, um, inventory system, your inventory system might rely on items and items might be another class. So that might be a better example, but I think this will make the point anyway. So now when you include data, it doesn't include other data, but if you include other data here, it's going to 
still include data because it's going to go down this list and it's going to say, okay, include data and then do all this stuff. Now, the thing to realize that's very important here is this include, including one of your header files is a literal copy and paste. So what this include other data does is it does this, it grabs all this and replaces it with like that. That's in your code now. So, and then as you include another one, if you included data afterwards, it would, it would be literally this. So it would be like, you did include data here, data.h, yeah, you get it. It will literally be doing this. So it's literally just like piling all this code in here, but we haven't include data here. So it would also be doing it right here. So you would get like this cascade of weird includes. And that's kind of the point of this pragma once is it means only include it once, but we don't want to do any of that. We just want to, yeah, you know, I'm just showing you how it works, I guess here. We just want to include it and uh, do its thing. But just so you know, it's a literal copy and paste. And if you're running into strange errors where it doesn't see something, it might be because the one you're including is below. So the order of the include can matter is the point I'm making here. Something relies on something else. It won't see it unless you've included the other one it relies on first. So you just include them as you go. And you can, another really nice thing is you don't have to duplicate this code in an associated CPP file. It's all right here. The definition is right here. It's all ready to go. So it reduces the number of files and it can make it a little cleaner. A lot of people like to do it this way, um, but there is a drawback to doing it this way. And that big drawback is really that uh, it's a single object rebuild. So if you change one header, the entire object needs to rebuild. So as with this previous version, if you change one thing, only the associated piece would have to rebuild. But this thing, no matter what you change, everything rebuilds. So it can lead to really long recompile time. So you make a little change and recompile, you're like, oh great, it takes five minutes again. Whereas your other way would be like, oh, it only takes 10 seconds. So in, in really large projects, this single object rebuild can take a really long time and small projects, not that big of a deal. So just be aware of that. And another method, which I haven't really mentioned here is the uh, monolithic, we call it monolithic. I think that's how you spell it. Mono I've, I've spelled that wrong. The monolithic C++ file. So some people will just go, um, they'll just do everything in one file. They'll say, no, screw headers, screw messing with files, screw, screw everything. I'm mad at the world. I don't want to deal with C++ anymore. I don't want to deal with headers and classes and files and yada, yada. So they just go, I'm only having one main and I'm putting my entire program in it, no matter how big it gets. So you end up with like million line CPP files with all your stuff just cascading in here. And it's essentially the same as doing a bunch of headers. You change one thing, the entire thing has to rebuild, but I'm just going to call it monolithic thick. Yeah, I went there. All right, so that's another way that people actually do it. It is, it works fine. All these methods work fine. You sure you can go on Stack Overflow and and like talk about it or ask questions about it and get harassed. These all get the job done. If you know how to code, you know how to structure stuff, you know how to build software, you know how C plus plus works. These all get it done. These all and these all lead to final finished apps. So don't get the point is don't get caught up in the jargon of your work and go with what you like. I personally pref prefer the pure flat these days. I, I even don't bind the monolithic and headers for everything until it starts to grow. Once it starts getting bigger, then you can kind of section it off and, and as needed. But if it compiles quickly anyway, it doesn't matter. All right, so that's it for the whole application section. Hopefully that was helpful. Now we're going to talk about one last part here, and that is including libraries. I'm going to kind of make this quick. So this is all, this is, leads back to developing your apps. As you're developing your applications, eventually you're going to run into something and kind of going back to my making libraries thing, you're going to be like, oh, I want to do this or I want to do that, but I don't want to spend like three months of my life writing it. So you just want to use someone else's library that already did it. And that's where including libraries comes in and maybe you've maybe you've wrote your own libraries to handle stuff and you just want to include your own now i'm not going to get into the fine details of the commands to pass into the command line to link stuff that's for another video i think i might have covered in other videos but the easiest way to do this is to use a manager vc package manager is probably the easiest one if you're on windows and this isn't talking about build systems like cmake's a actually cmake is a 
a build system generator. So it's like a build system for build system, but we're not talking about that here. Then we're talking about just how to get them included. So VC package manager, Conan, this admittedly, this is a pretty confusing topic. I would like to dive more into it, but I'll be here all day. And honestly, I would, I should structure my stuff better before I start talking about it. So well, I'm just going to keep it simple using a manager, VC package manager. I'll link, leave a link, uh, somewhere down below. I have a video about it. There's other ones. There's Conan. I haven't personally used Conan, but I've heard good things and it looks nice. They're very similar. They're basically like, if you're familiar with the whole node system that, um, everyone uses, it's sort of like that. You just do, you just do the command from, for VC package manager. Once you get it set up, it just has a command where you can do stuff, VC, PKG, update, etc. So you can, uh, you can do all your commands, install your libraries, and it tells you how to link them or how to set them up with your build system. So basically it handles building them for you and it handles pulling down the latest version for you and that sort of stuff. You can also do it manually, which I've done some videos on as well. I'll try to find one to link. There might be several different ones. It might be a bit scattered, but basically if you're doing it manually, you go download the source code, you build it, and then you link it. And of course you include the headers, which should be something like this. So you can do it manually for your projects too. If you want to have it all in one nice chunk that you can pass around to your friends or whatever, and not have to worry about whether they have a manager set up or not. You can also download the pre-built ones and link that way it skips the build section. Uh, you just download the pre-built binaries is what you see them called binaries. So if you see pre-built binaries, they, they've already done that. It just includes the header and the final object that you have to link with your program so that you can actually use the stuff in the headers. So essentially the stuff, the pre-built ones, well, includes the public headers, but it includes, it doesn't include any of the private source files. It only includes the final object that those built into that way these includes actually work because those just point to them basically. All right. Another way to do it is get sub modules. This is probably my favorite way to do it if you're doing it manually, but you could, you can basically point to a repo on GitHub and then have the commands, um, set up within whatever your build system or pre-build system is to automatically do it with Git sub modules. I'll link a video to that. I think a lot of people found it helpful. So it's kind of an eye opener. If you've never used Git sub modules, super nice. So yeah, my two favorite are definitely get sub modules and VC package manager, put this download and doing it manually or getting the binaries. It's fine too. And is often nice because you don't have to worry about things changing on you with sub modules. Sometimes you pull down the latest version and update and break something. Same with VC package manager. If you're doing it manually, uh, you will kind of run, you don't necessarily run into that. And the very last thing I just want to touch on, I don't really want to talk about too much is the build systems. Um, in general, your IDE, accidentally spelled die fitting for us programmers. <laughs> uh, we're all masochists, right? That's the meme. All right. So you can use CMake, you can use pre-make, you can rely on your IDE to set it up for you. Like visual studio community edition pretty much does it for you with MS build. Uh, Xcode will do it automatically. You can set up, uh, make files within most editors. So this is the whole topic on its own, but just know that there's some options out there. I have a a tutorial on CMake if you want to check that out. But otherwise, I would suggest just using Visual Studio Community Edition or your favorite one and just do some some reading up on how to generally do uh, link and build with that one. Because once you learn one of them really well, the rest become a lot easier because they're all very similar. They ultimately all do the same thing. They just run the build command in a command like format, which is just a long GCC, all your stuff, and then all your linker commands. And, um, yeah, it's just all that. They basically just handle doing that for you. Um, so pick your poison. Some people even like to do it manually. They'll create just scripts or batch files that uh, have their commands. So they know exactly what's going on. And it's not abstracted behind some other build system generator but the choice is yours. All right. I hope this video has been helpful. I've tried to rush through it. I've tried to make it as short as possible with as much info as possible. So, uh, leave a like, please. I would appreciate it. And if you want to go the extra mile, sign up on Patreon, help me keep making these videos for free for you guys by being one of the people that pays. <laughs> that didn't come out how I intended, but oh, well, all right. Peace out guys. Hope you have a good one. See you in the next episode. Matt from Code Tech Tutorials over now.